Thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm Rich Daquila, and it's um, it's a real pleasure uh, for me to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Robin Mermelstein. I know her well because NUCATS collaborates extensively with the CTSA hubs at UIC and the University of Chicago. And Dr. Mermelstein is the uh, contact PI for the UIC Center for Clinical and Translational Science. Robin is a consummate translational scientist with a deep commitment to community engagement and a real delight to work with. We're so happy that you're here, Robin. Let me tell them just a bit more about you before I let you get started. Uh, Dr. Mermelstein is Distinguished Professor of Psychology, Director of the Institute for Health Research and Policy at UIC, a Clinical Professor of Community Health Sciences at the School of Public Health there, and an Assistant Dean in the College of Medicine. She also is an active member on many review and advisory committees at NIH. Her research has been continuously supported by NIH on the topic of her talk today, Understanding and Reducing Tobacco Use Across All Ages and Vulnerable Populations. She's uh, performed longitudinal studies of the etiology of youth smoking, as well as cessation interventions for adult smokers. She co-wrote the uh, consensus study report, Public Health Implications of Raising the Minimum Age of Legal Access to Tobacco Products, and is currently one of the MPIs of the NIH-funded Center for Coordination of Analytics, Science, Enhancement, and Logistics in Tobacco Regulatory Science, a U54 uh, award serving as the scientific lead integrating tobacco regulatory science across multiple funded centers. Robin, thanks for being here today. Um, thanks, Rich. This is really a pleasure for me to have the chance to talk, even though I don't see everybody, but um, hopefully generate a lot of questions at the end and have time for discussion. Um, let me try to move forward with just my usual disclosures, um, which are just from NIH grants or all of my funding right now, and I have no other um, financial disclosures to report. Several years ago when I chaired an FDA um, committee, I learned don't, don't get any financial disclosures. It would be a nightmare to have to keep reporting all of them. So I'm pretty clean these days. I wanna just start with what we all know, which is that we have a lot of health problems that are not easy to solve. And most of them are what we call wicked problems. And they are a constellation of biological, behavioral, psychological, and social structural factors. And as we talk about tobacco, which I'll talk about in a, in a little bit, that really is the um, great example of how dealing with tobacco-related harms and illnesses is truly a complex and a wicked problem. So in order to address these problems, we need a very large collaborative effort with people along the spectrum. I learned that long ago with, with tobacco, I need to understand the pharmacology, the genetics of it, the marketing of it, the regulatory aspects, and of course, the treatment and behavioral parts as well. What we've also learned um, in the last couple of decades is we've had a lot of advancements from science across the board in, in all of our illnesses and diseases, but population health really is still lagging behind. And what we're trying to do as the CTSAs in the Chicago area, NUCATS at Northwestern, um, the Institute for Translational Medicine based primarily down at University of Chicago and us at UIC, is work together to accelerate and amplify those discoveries and really be a model for the city of Chicago, how together we can work and make a difference at a population level within Chicago and get our discoveries in the hands of the general public to really improve the health. So we view our collective role across our, our three hubs as really advocates for translation. And what we want to do is help with dissemination of information. How do you collaborate? And importantly, how do you get things in the hands of the people who are best positioned to act on them or to receive help from them? Today, what we want to serve on as well as trusted messengers, because there is so much misinformation out there, conflicting information related to health and what people should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing, what kinds of precautions to take. 
And our hope is that across our three hubs, we can serve as perhaps somewhat of that arbiter of all that information and be your trusted guide to help people navigate through it and really promote the voice of people. So what we do know is that misinformation is out there a lot. And really what that leads to is bad policy, bad practice. And so our hope, like with this talk today, is really to cultivate informed public and create environments that allows the research that we do at the university to actually reach the public. So I'm going to give the example of tobacco use as one area where there's lots of information. Some of it is conflicting more recently and really trying to make a difference in how do you influence population health. And I'm just going to start with still what's true is that combustible cigarette smoking is a leading preventable cause of cancer morbidity and mortality in the United States. And across all um, causes of death, it accounts for one in five deaths still in the United States. So more than 450,000 deaths a year. And prior to the COVID pandemic, um, it would be easy for me to say it's still the number one preventable cause. There was a while, sadly, where COVID-19 um, overcame tobacco-related causes of, of death. And globally, it's still 7 million deaths a year. And when smokers uh, get ill, primarily they get a variety of cancers, respiratory, vascular diseases as well. This is an area where we now want to be trusted messengers. Um, 40, 50, 60 years ago, this was not the case, where people didn't know a whole lot about tobacco and people who you rely on physicians, um, unfortunately, were portrayed as um, perhaps not the most trusted source of information. And these are ads from the 40s and 50s that uh, really show before a lot of information was out there about the dangers of smoking, um, perhaps people wanting to trust your physician about how do you make a choice. And when 60% of the adult male population is smoking, these were powerful ads as, mm -hmm. as well. Over time, um, tobacco companies also started to promote ads in different ways. And this is one that rings true in multiple ways, which is an old ad, which is to smoke a Lucky to feel your level best. And Lucky is fine. Tobacco picks you up when you feel low and calms you down when you feel tense, which was the perfect description of what cigarette smoking does for people. It's the ultimate mood regulator, picking people up when they feel down and calming them down when they're agitated and anxious. Tobacco companies knew that, and this became a way of life for, for many, many people. Over time, uh, those messages changed and tobacco companies started promoting pleasure and particularly started promoting ads to different populations as well. It also became the very cool way to go and ads changed. And more recently, tobacco companies promoted cigarettes to specific groups of people, whether it was LGBTQ plus or um, black different populations and messages of empowerment. By smoking, you became empowered. And those were really important messages that the tobacco companies were trying to portray. Fortunately, things have changed, um, but that's still in the background. And the good news is that cigarette smoking in the last few years has dropped dramatically, far beyond our hopes and expectations of when you set guidelines and you set marks about where you wanna be in 10 years, we've now exceeded them. So among adults in the United States and our latest national data from 2021, only 11.5% were current smokers, defined as some day or every day, and which is down from close to 21% in 2005. Just dramatic changes. Um, still, when you're getting 11% of the population, it's 34 million adult Americans still are smoking. But it's not equivalent across the board. There are huge disparities. Smoking is higher among individuals who are economically disadvantaged, lower educated, uh, sadly, in the Midwest, as well as in the South, and particularly among those who have any kind of psychological distress or those individuals who identify as LGBTQ. 
cigarette smoking is going down, which is really, really good news. But the other part of that is that in the last 15 years or so, tobacco products have diversified incredibly. So when I first started in this field more than 30 years ago, you know, the cigarettes is all I worried about, maybe cigars. And occasionally somebody had became a, pope, a pipe smoker. But now we have all kinds of combustible products, cigarettes, cigars, cigarillos, pipes, roll your own. But we have an hookah and we have a variety of non-combustible products as well. Um, people think of e-cigarettes, heated tobacco products, snooze, smokeless, and these all range and how they're marketed as well as their health harms are important to distinguish. So with this in mind, very recently in 2017, the FDA came up under the leadership then of Scott Gottlieb and Mitch Seller with a whole new approach to regulating tobacco. And their strategy had two parts. The first part was to say, we're going to regulate how addictive combustible cigarettes will be. And so they wanted to reduce the addictiveness of combustible cigarettes by systematically lowering nicotine content in, in them, but also at the same time recognizing that maybe there are less harmful tobacco products that could have a positive role and could play a role in improving health and getting people off combustible products. So what has evolved is this notion that there is a continuum of harm from different tobacco products. At one end is the extreme toxicity of any tobacco, combusted tobacco product. So we have cigarettes as by far the most toxic element, small cigars, pipes, cigars, water pipe hookah. At the other end is obviously no harm from no use. But then there's an array of products from smokeless tobacco. And a great example is snus, which we don't isn't very prevalent here in the US, but in Sweden, it's very prevalent and has basically eliminated lung cancer from um, the Norwegian countries has taken over from cigarettes and, and gotten rid of lung cancer in doing so. And we have now e-cigs as well as some other um, nicotine related products by far on a continuum of harm, much less than combusted cigarettes. So part of the FDA and the notion of tobacco harm minimization is recognition that we shouldn't be treating all products the same. And maybe what we can do is move people down the continuum of harm so that even if they're unable to quit, why not help them adjust or adapt into something that's far less harm harmful? You know, we do harm minimization and harm reduction in lots of other approaches. People think about methadone and opioid use and a variety of other approaches, but it has not seriously been considered for tobacco since there weren't alternatives. There may now well be some good alternatives. So are people using this? What are they using? So again, from the National Health Interview Survey data, cigarettes 11.5%. Any combustible is about 14.5% of adults. Some of that is use of little cigars, pipes, and hookah. E-cigs are only about four and a half percent, although I know people are always surprised that it's that low. Um, smokeless tobacco is 2.1 percent, and people often use multiple products as well. The really good news, though, is, you know, as we look towards the future, future generations of smokers may not exist much in the U.S. anymore because the prevalence of combustible tobacco use among adolescents is now at an all time low. Um, when I first was doing, I had a very large program project grant for 15 years at, on adolescent smoking, rates of adolescent smoking were over 30%. It's totally different right now. So what are kids using? Um, any tobacco product, only 12.6% of kids now. And these are data from 2023. E-cigarettes, the most common tobacco product used among adolescents is 10%. But look at where cigarettes are. 1.9% of adolescents, high school students are using cigarettes. That's remarkable. Um, at, at a level that when I was part of the Institute of Medicine Committee to 
write the report on reducing and rec and what which eventually got tobacco 21 laws in place we never thought we'd see below five percent and that was less than 10 years ago um so the fact that we're now cigarettes are now at 1.9 percent is truly remarkable and this is only good news here you know if you look at this slide this is and what it means for the future is that we're less and less likely to have um, adults who are smoking by far the most, most toxic element. But there's just lots that you hear about e-cigarettes. And so what are you hearing and what, what do we know? Well, e-cigarettes have changed a lot over time. And they started out in what we'll call the first generation, which were cigalikes. They looked like cigarettes. And they've progressed over time to what are now pods. And what people think about, you know, they're exchangeable and removable, they're rechargeable, refillable, you plug them in. Um, people think of what became the most infamous one was Juul, which is now also totally reformulated uh, after having really poor marketing practices to adolescents. But this is what people think about. They look like a USB port, like, you know, a, a flash drive, and you can flip them out and put different flavors in different strains. You can modify, you can't modify these anymore. But this is what an e-cigarette of today pretty much looks like. So this is where we start getting into what is the information out there and why is this so controversial? Because e-cigarettes is by far um, the most controversial and divisive issue in the history of tobacco control in the United States, where some people see it as the future of really eliminating combustible tobacco. Others see it as, you know, you're dancing with the devil again. And who knows what, what can happen with that. So we get ads, you know, that are promoted to kids and look like perhaps not necessarily good. We get the truth campaign and others trying to scare kids not to use, you know, it's a taste of poison. And if you're vaping nicotine, you're going to have mood swing. You're looking sick. It's stress. Um, this is what gets promoted to kids. At the same time, where some of our media has these, you know, more harm messaging towards kids, we get these messages towards adults you know, take the first step to better health at your next birthday or anniversary, you know, or if you're still smoking, maybe switch to e-cigarettes. So what do you, you know, as a public, what do you do? How do you navigate all of this information? Who's the, where do you put your trust in listening to this? And how do you reconcile the fact that you get these scary messages that e-cigarettes are harmful and they're awful and they're the, the you know, evil again. And then you get this hopeful message of e-cigarettes as maybe they're a good way for smokers to quit. So the FDA and now has what Congress passed in 2009 is the Tobacco Control Act. And basically it all comes down to thinking about how do we protect the public health? It's a balancing act. And there are, is no guidance. This is all subjective. But in allowing any product, any tobacco or nicotine product, because nicotine is now also under the FDA's authority, to go onto the market, the FDA must consider scientific evidence that the risks and benefits of that product as a whole are going to help. That's the public health standard, that they'll overall protect the public health. So what that means is for every single product that comes on the market, they have a market authorization request and can they go and, and be sold? They have to demonstrate that perhaps this product might lead to an increased likelihood of cessation for adults and a decreased you know, or not effect on adolescents. So with every product, and there are literally millions that the FDA has to review of e-cigarette applications, each one separately has to have this balancing act, which is a nightmare at the moment. And even yesterday, a new ruling came out that the FDA was being capricious in their decisions about market authorizations and not. So it's really challenging, but the question is, where do you balance? Do you balance putting a priority on preventing kids from initiating and potentially getting them addicted? Or do you put a balance on saving millions of lives? And that's the struggle that people are trying to figure out with e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. 
So the pros and cons. The pros for e-cigarettes are that vaping may help a subset of nicotine addicted smokers to quit, and it has a lot less risk. And there's, which I'll go over in a minute, considerable data that it shows e-cigarettes have actually led to this remarkable decline in um, smoking across both adolescents and adults. The cons that seem to be in the media more are that vaping causes nicotine addiction among young people who probably never would have become, a, you know, perhaps smoked or will lead people to perhaps think that smoking's okay. Um, it's concern that nicotine might damage the developing brains of, of young people. And um, some people don't think that it's not safe. You I mean, some people think that it's, it is potentially more harmful than others. So what do we know about the health risks? Um, we actually do a, a good amount by now. The National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine characterize the overall risk as um, less likely, you know, and far less harmful than combustible cigarettes. The British Royal College of Physicians similarly concluded that vaping isn't completely risk-free, but far less harmful than smoking. Um, numbers of toxic chemicals are far, far less in e-cigarettes. Um, cigarette smoke overall just contains many more toxic ingredients. And we see good evidence that um, long-term vaping does not seem to have any negative or deleterious effects, um, but rather, you know, it, it overall poses just a small fraction of the risks of smoking. And even though there may be some consequences for long-term vaping, they're significantly lower than the risks of smoking and pretty low in absolute terms as, as well. But the press um, really goes all out at times. And I had um, recently in the fall heard a report from Northwest, it wasn't Northwestern, it was housed in the media, but a very nice story about a successful lung, um, double lung transplant of a patient. And this was in the media because of the um, more humorous side, perhaps, that he needed to get breast implants to hold up the lungs for a while. And this guy had been a, I guess, a 20 year smoker, but then recently started vaping. All the media reports reported instead about his vaping and as if that caused his lung damage and not reporting on his prior years of, of smoking. So poor media reporting on that, I thought as well. But what we usually hear from the media is that vaping is as harmful as smoking and it's just not true. We for a while heard a lot about vaping causing popcorn lung, which is also um, not true and there's no evidence or vaping caused Evoli. Well, what we know is vaping THC, not nicotine is what, and not e-cigarettes caused Evoli, but Evoli was named um, for based on e-cigarettes because people were afraid and just assumed it was e-cigarettes that were causing it when it didn't. And again, that the you know media often talks about that vaping is very harmful or portrays all the lung damage from, from vaping. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. But we also now have a large amount of um, information that vaping increases smoking cessation of combustible cigarettes. We have RCTs from England, we have RCTs from New Zealand, and then in the US, not exactly an RCT for FDA regulatory reasons, but more recently that unguided e-cigarette use can lead to um, smoking cessation. And importantly, the Cochrane Review really, um, which is a large scale meta-analysis of, of all studies, found that e-cigarettes with nicotine are more effective than nicotine replacement therapy um, for helping people quit. In the United Kingdom, e-cigarettes are the number one recommendation for getting people to stop smoking and the number one requested vehicle for people to stop smoking. In the US, we have a very different regulatory process. And so there are no e-cigarettes that are approved at this point for smoking cessation. And it's unlikely to happen that they will get that as, as an indication because of the regulatory hurdles. People are also concerned about what's the so-called gateway hypothesis. It's the belief that any nicotine, you know, especially with e-cigarettes, 
is going, if you, you start with that, it's going to open up the floodgates and the gateway and that kids who start to use on e-cigarettes are going to progress to combustible combustibles and become lifelong smokers. Um, people actually were very concerned about that in the past with nicotine replacement and with smokeless, and it just doesn't happen. Um, and had this gateway hypothesis held true, we would have accepted, you know, expected to see an increase in smoking in young people and adults, and it just hasn't happened. There have been some very good longitudinal studies that have shown that your odds of becoming a smoker if you had vaped first are significantly higher. So yes, their odds ratios of two to 3%. In absolute numbers, that's around 1%. So the absolute gateway just isn't there in terms of our kids progressing to cigarettes. We also know now from population trend modeling that there just isn't the evidence of a, import of a gateway, that smoking keeps dropping faster than we've expected. And these are our recent data from Fox, and then I'll just try to step you through this. This is the line, these are adolescents of decline over time that you see, and the circles and the crosses are the actual data lines. The shaded is what population modeling would have expected. We would have seen the declines, but only there. This is where the actual smoking rates are at now, far exceeding what any modeling has shown. These are the rates of e-cigarette use. So what you see is that just before the pandemic and in e-cigarette rates were at an all-time high among kids, and then they've dropped dramatically since the COVID-19 pandemic for, for many reasons. And the pandemic, they were already starting to trend down actually just before the pandemic, um, but the social isolation of kids likely and lack of access made a big difference in dropping e-cigs, and they're not going back up. For adults, again, we see this is the trend line for population modeling. And this is what actually is happening. So again, we see that the um, combustible cigarette smoking has gone down much faster than expected. And at the same time, rates of e-cigs are going up a little bit more than expected. So we need to think about what the question is for population health that we want to present here. And I think the goal is for everyone will agree that you want to end combustible tobacco use. That's the harmful one. That's what causes the death and causes all kinds of illnesses. And there's no easy way. This is the wicked problem. This is a really complex, it's, an, it's a truly a difficult addiction to deal with and many reinforcers. So e-cigarettes might provide a reasonable alternative for smokers who haven't been able to quit or who are not yet ready to quit. Quitting is not easy. For any smoker, if you've ever talked with them and to try to help them to quit, it's, you know, for them, probably the hardest thing they've ever done and a very memorable event in their life when they do succeed. So we really need to focus on, can this perhaps be the next step to have greater success than our current pharmacotherapies, which are not well used or our behavioral treatments for smokers and have really limited success as well. So lots of smokers seem to adopt e-cigarettes or at least try, although I also hear from smokers they're scared to um, because they're scared that they are substituting something that's just as bad. So why, why switch? But what we need to know is that how do you help smokers who want to switch to switch or to take that first step to what is really seen as, as harm reduction? So we know that smokers sometimes go through a dual use phase where they're using both cigarettes and e-cigarettes. And what we and that's actually the most common way adults start to use e-cigarettes is they're smokers who start to try. But can we now help those people who are dual users to transition? So I'm going to talk about some data from a recent study of mine, which was just an observational study of, but an in-depth observational study of, of dual users. What we wanted to do was people find people who were early in their uptake of e-cigarettes, follow them over time, and see what predicts who is successful and what can we learn from their transitions to see what matters, because that might then help future regulatory decisions as well as cessation opportunities. So we did 
a lot of in-depth assessments. We gave people smartphones to collect data um, with an app in real time as they used a product. They would you know, record, they would randomly get, get prompted. So real-time data about what their experiences were with using products. We track them for a year and lots of questionnaires always collect far more data than we ever get to. Um, this was a little more than 400 people. 64% were, were male, pretty diverse as you would expect in Chicago in their mid thirties. And about 19% had no more than a high school education and most, most were employed. Importantly, we did not want actually people who wanted to quit because if they wanted to quit, we would have put them into a cessation program as it is. Um, most people though will say, well, yeah, in the future I wanna quit. Or maybe they'll say that they want to quit in six months, which basically means that's a more socially acceptable. But on a one to 10 scale, none of these people would you see in a cessation program because their motivation was really pretty low. Um, just to let you know that to start with, individuals were smoking about eight cigarettes a day. We are well past the days when people were pack a day smokers. Most most smokers now are smoking far less, which is also good news. Um, but they're smoking almost every day. It's also not uncommon now for people not, you know, to have several days during a month for a variety of reasons when they're not smoking. Their e-cigarette rates were a lot less than their cigarette, and both in terms of how much a day they used and um, how many days a month. And that was by design because we wanted to see who uptakes in e-cigarettes and what happens. Um, surprisingly, when we looked over 12 months, and these are people for whom we had complete data of the um, 410 down to 364, almost 24% of the people totally quit smoking on their own, which is hugely remarkable. Um, because overall, if in just the US population, you might get only 7% of the people who are smoking quit. In this sample of those users, 24% stopped smoking, which is huge. And of them, um, Another 30% of those actually also quit vaping. A good number, almost 21%, cut back on their cigarettes by more than 50%. And about a third didn't change at all. But the fact that we had so many people spontaneously quit over this one year and again, stayed and biochemically confirmed abstinence for 30 days at 12 months, um, if I ever had a cessation trial that looked like that good, I'd be really happy at 12 months. That would have been great. So our question was what predicts who's successful at um, quitting. And so what we wanted to look at here were, you know, who actually quit completely and um, then who was continuing to smoke. And first you look at demographics. So uh, somewhat surprisingly, the people who quit were more likely to be male. They were a little younger than others, um, more likely to be white and um, less likely to be well-educated. And those are often what you see in any cessation trial. Remember, this isn't a cessation trial. They're not getting any information about how to quit and they were not motivated to quit. But um, as usual, slightly more educated men, younger um, and more likely to be white were the ones who quit successfully on their own. They also tended to smoke a little less to start with and to use e-cigs a little more compared to the other groups um, at baseline. So they were already perhaps on their way of, you know, a little lighter, but not hugely different, you know, five compared to seven in eight um, cigarettes a day. Nobody was motivated to quit at baseline. These are all, you know, the plan to quit 6.3%, 4%, 3%, 5%. Nobody really um, said that they were going to quit at baseline. So the fact that a year later they were quit was pretty remarkable. One of the um, big controversies at the moment in e-cigarettes are the value of flavors. And flavors are, are banned in some cities. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, what's happened in, with flavor bans. Uh, but the people who quit were more likely to prefer a flavored e-cigarette and to use an e-cigarette than they were to use a tobacco flavor. Um, far greater to use either a sweet or fruit flavored. Blueberry is actually one of the most popular flavors to help people quit. Um, a little less likely to use a, a menthol or mint 
but um, mostly to use sweet, but not to use tobacco. One of our key hypotheses was that if somebody is going to switch, they better like it. Um, we've learned from nicotine replacement therapies, people don't like to use them, therefore they don't use them. They never dose themselves enough. And part of the issue with smoking cessation is you do need to get enough nicotine back in your system, not to have withdrawal, to feel good. And we also know that nicotine and combustible cigarettes make you feel good. They regulate your mood. So we were very interested in are people getting the same mood benefits from e-cigarettes as they are from their combustible cigarettes? And how pleasurable, how satisfied are they? Because what if you want to find a good substitute for cigarettes, you got to hit that sweet spot, which is that they have the appeal that they have less harm, but high appeal. So people will switch to something that's less harmful if it has really high levels of appeal and satisfaction. And for us, that was, are they mood benefits and do they perceive pleasure and satisfaction? So we used a variety of fancy analytic approaches. Um, just to let you know that to start with, e-cigarettes were providing them with the same level of pleasure and satisfaction overall. So estimated, and these are from their real-time data reports, their estimated level of satisfaction for cigarettes on a one to 10 scale averaged was 7.3. And for uh, ENDS is electronic nicotine delivery systems. For e-cigarettes is 7.3. We know that if they were more satisfied with cigarettes relative to their e-cig, so a higher satisfaction was to cigarettes tend to be associated with lower satisfaction to your to your e-cigarettes. So they're, you know, if, if you really love your cigarettes, you may not quite love your e-cigarettes as much. But what we did see, very importantly, if they were satisfied with their e-cigarette, especially relative to cigarettes, so as their levels of satisfaction increased, their levels of cigarettes decreased. Very strong effect, very strong over time. Um, if they had relatively more satisfaction from cigarettes, they're going to keep actually increasing their cigarette use over time. But if they had relatively less satisfaction with cigarettes, they're going to increase their e-cigs. It makes total sense. Satisfaction matters. So you want to design a substitute for cigarettes that actually is appealing and satisfies. And that's important to know. Great mood responses, as we would expect. But what's important to know in these graphs, first we'll look at their change in positive affect. And we measure this in real time, just before they use a product, cigarette or e-cigarette, and just, just after they use a product. The red line are people who smoke. So everyone gets a boost in positive affect. You use the product, whether the nicotine does this, you feel better. Um, but what you see is, is that the people who, who smoke got good, who quit got good levels. Change in um, negative affect, people who quit got decreases in negative affects. So it's doing what it's supposed to do is you're getting that reduction. But importantly, the satisfaction, and we have lots of data that we were looking at in all the real-time reports. These are the number of, of data points that go into these. The no smoking group, if you compare their pleasure ratings, the people who quit from cigarettes to e-cigarettes, you see that they had significantly higher levels of satisfaction from their e-cigarette than they did from their, their cigarette. The opposite was true of people who did not quit. And their, that's their pleasure, their satisfaction, the same pattern. So we know that that relative difference, and it's e-cigarettes in order to be a substitute to help someone quit, they have to deliver. And they have to deliver in that pleasure principle. We then looked at, um, sometimes people will call this machine learning, but it's not conditional classification tree where you can put in lots of things and, and variables and hierarchically decide and you know, through different algorithms, what matters. So we looked at demographics, we looked at product level variables such as flavorings, we looked at those values of satisfaction and, and pleasure, you know, so this is, and then we looked at a variety of situational factors just to see in the moment what decides, are you gonna pick up your cigarette or are you gonna use an e-cigarette? Because we had that real-time data. And what matters was the higher your urge for a cigarette, you're more likely to. 
um, and whether smoking was allowed in that particular situation. But very importantly, flavor came out as a hugely important factor that if you were to use anything other than a tobacco flavored, you were more likely to go to the e-cigarette than to your cigarette. So it came out just as important as urge for cigarette as important. So dual users are a very, very heterogeneous group, but to our delight and surprise, 24% stop smoking on their own, 21% reduced, and these are great clinically meaningful results. Um, people who can quit, they're distinguished by demographics being male, white, and younger. They tended to smoke a little less at baseline, but they also did prefer those sweet flavored e-cigarettes, some rechargeable devices, and relatively the pleasure mattered. Um, they were also more likely to use an e-cigarette. The first, you know, one of the strategies was just to keep that by your bed instead of your cigarette and you wake up and start the day. The choice was important to them of being able to try and then um, pick a flavor choice that they might want. So if we want to optimize people to completely switch, because ideally you don't want people to be dual users, you want them totally off combustibles, um, we have to think about environmental messages and what helps and doesn't help. The messaging is really bad out there. Physicians don't know what to tell their patients. Uh, the media tends to get it wrong as opposed to right. And the public of smokers who cares or people who advise them are very, very cautious about switching to e-cigarettes. Um, people do need to have some advice and some help and skills and how to switch. But importantly, um, guidance for the FDA, and certainly, believe me, the vape manufacturers know this, the perceived pleasure is hugely important. The issue of flavors and bans and alternatives. Um, some cities have already passed bans about flavors. And there's a lot of data, for example, um, you know, recently from, from San Francisco, and I can't remember if I put this in here, about, about bans. Well, I probably do. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get to them. Um, just in terms of other lessons for the future, smokers would benefit from guidance about how to switch. Uh, it's not easy. So they really do need help. And um, some ways of what we call a relapse prevention approach, we don't want them to backslide if, if it's taking them a while to figure out it's not a, exactly the same. Vaping isn't the same as smoking. So there is a learning curve. Um, but e-cigarettes actually allow them to personalize the product. And especially they can either pick a cigarette, pick their device, pick how they want to use it and when. And if this is sort of that personalized, personalized medicine approach we can do. Um, we've learned now a little bit about flavor bans, which we should pay attention to. Every city and San Francisco is remarkable for this that has put in flavor bans, has then seen an increased sale of combustible cigarettes and combustible smoking rates go up. Um, bans are de-incentivizing a far safer product. People put the van, the bans in because they're afraid that's why kids take up vaping is for the flavors. Well, kids are, you know, even when there are flavors in place in cities, their vaping rates are going down. So maybe we've thrown out too much here and a flavor ban was based more on fear than on actual data perhaps. So messaging and support and helping people navigate through all this information out there, we don't want poor policy. We don't want things to backfire and have um, people going back to combustible cigarettes because they're afraid of, of what they may be doing. So these misperceptions about nicotine are common. People think that it's nicotine that causes cancer. People think that nicotine is the deadly thing. Um, and they, you know, perceptions are, are going to affect if we do ever get um, nicotine, very low levels of nicotine in combustible cigarettes, there's going to be a lot of bad messaging around that too. So I think physicians and healthcare providers need to be aware of just what is it in cigarettes and what's harmful about nicotine or not, because they are prescribers, they are sources of information. And um, low nicotine cigarettes are not less harmful, they're less addictive but low nicotine cigarettes continue to have the same harms. The goal of low nicotine 
cigarettes is perhaps by withdrawing people from nicotine. And there are questions about that, they will quit. But they're not less harmful. They're just less addictive, which then perhaps they are less harmful. So there are lots of educational needs. Um, people need to know about the relative harms of nicotine. They need to know about what else is in different products and how do they navigate their way through the nicotine maze, which is out there. Um, but these are all good opportunities for us to move people off the most toxic. And um, we really need to think about how do we get to the place where smokers aren't demonized if, and rather that just because they need nicotine, we think about alternative ways of helping them get nicotine as perhaps the first step away. Um, it's a really good time for smokers to quit right now. So um, I, this is back to the CTSAs. I think the CTSAs can serve as important translators of all this information. Um, where are smokers gonna go when lower nicotine standards are mandated? That keeps getting pushed back, but it's coming in the next couple of years. Um, they're probably gonna go to illegal sources. That's what smokers are telling us now that they're gonna go. They're gonna go to social sources. They're gonna switch to other um, combusted products to get the nicotine because they're afraid that e-cigarettes are, are more harmful. So the policy implications need to be considered. So while all this is going on for e-cigarettes, what we really need to talk about are heated tobacco products because they have taken over other countries and they're likely to, you know, uh, right now, um, Philip Morris International, which is the big manufacturer of ICOS, which is a heated, not electronic and not combusted tobacco product and has been authorized for marketing in the U.S., but it's held up in court right now because of some patent issues. So it's not being marketed anymore. But in Japan and Italy and other countries, it's overwhelmed and taken e-cigarettes are out. Heated tobacco products, which are far less um, harmful than combusted cigarettes and are also very satisfying to smokers, have really taken over. And these are all the new nicotine delivery systems that are in our future probably as well here in the in the US and um, Philip Morris has marketed them in a very cool way and has all kinds of age gatings on them, but they are marketed like an Apple store is how, what they look like. So I'm gonna stop here and I'll stop sharing. I don't know if I can see people, but happy to um, answer any questions. Thank you, Robin. That, that's so interesting. I have so many questions, but let me first tell everybody uh, if you have a question, please um, put it into the Q&A box. Uh, the little button is on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and we'll, um, I I'll go ahead and start because I, I have so many <laughs> new people questions. <laughs> well, like one basic one is our belief is that nicotine is what addicts you to smoking, whether it's you know, whichever delivery system. Right. But does the difference in quitting between e-cigarettes and combustible products mean that one is more addicting than the other? And how how would that work? Yeah, so um, it's, you know, addiction, yes, the nicotine is totally the addictive component. And um, so it's both a pharmacological phenomenon and a delivery and a psychological phenomenon. So e-cigarettes can um, vary in their power and their delivery. So some you can get a faster dose of, of nicotine. Mm -hmm. There have been a few um, e-cigarette cessation trials of trying to get people off of the vapes. And they have like double the quit rates of um, what you see in a normal cessation. So it does seem like if you do get on vaping and you want to quit, it's actually much easier to quit than it is from combustible cigarettes. Right. Well, we have some questions from the audience. So uh, Cindy Veldhus asks, hi, Robin, fascinating. Oh, hey, Cindy. <laughs> uh, you addressed this a bit at the end. What's, uh, what is dependence like among e-cig users? I'm also interested to know whether there were differences in dependence among Dual users are shifted to more e-cig use. Also, I know some people use cigarettes for appetite suppression. Does using e-cigs have any impacts on weight eating behavior? 
Does using more sweet flavored e-cigs increase cravings for sweet foods? Oh, Cindy, as always, really good questions. Um, so the measures of, of nicotine dependence, people do not seem to be quite an, as dependent on e-cigs. And so their levels of nicotine dependence, which is a little different than combusted cigarettes, those, those are lower. Is it an appetite suppressant? Well, if nicotine is, it likely is, although I don't know of those, um, those studies per se. The sweet there's a huge part, though, about um, sweeteners, and there is a group of researchers at Yale who look at levels of sucrose that's in them, and mm. the, which interacts synergistically with the nicotine and may make them more both pleasurable and addictive, so dependence. So this is one of those components with taste and chemistry. Levels of sucrose matter in these is, is all I know. Another question from Don Ziegler. In your study of the 25% who quit, how did they? Any quit cold turkey? Well, it depends on now on what you want to call cold turkey. So if cold turkey, you mean abrupt cessation, um, they were using e-cigs. So no, it wasn't like day one, they set a quit date and they were going to quit. So it, it did seem like it was a um, ramping up of e-cig and some of them actually quit the e-cigs over time. Interestingly though, in the few cessation trials where they've looked at, should you do a um, quick switch or a gradual switch, it seems like the long-term, you know, like a just switch immediately completely as, a, as opposed to tailoring seems to work better. But in this study, they faded more. Hmm. Uh Another question is, you mentioned a product in Sweden that substantially reduced the yes. smoke rate. I could not understand the name. What was it? So S-N-U-S, Swedish, Swedish Match Snus. So Snus is a um, type of tobacco pouch product, not like American. It's not like American smokeless, um, but it has been in Sweden for decades now. And that's essentially the preferred tobacco product in Sweden and rates of lung cancer. I mean, it's remarkable if you look at the epidemiological data. There is a snus product that is approved for distribution for marketing in the US, um, but Swedish, Swedish match snus has been a huge public health success that in the US we tend not to hear about. I'm a, I'm a real pessimist. So any increases in oral? oral? No, no. That's what shocked me because I that's exactly what I thought too. But um, having reviewed this data when I, I was chairing the FDA Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee. So when the committee you know recommended for the approval of some snus here, we had to look at those data really carefully. I, I, whereas smokeless, you do see yeah. American smokeless, you see all the head and neck oral cancers. It doesn't, it's not there with snus. It's a very, it's a manufacturer, it's different process. I mean, that's part of the, the evil secrets of um, tobacco is you can manufacture a safer tobacco plant. Mm, yeah. Okay, one more. Evanston just passed its first total flavor ban. Yeah. Is this good or bad? What about Hollywood's total ban on sales? Well, none of the California um, cities that have had their bans have had really good success with them. They're bad, bad policy. So I currently have a um, switching trial that's funded by the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, where part of what we're looking at is flavor choice and giving people an option to have a choice of flavors or just stick with their tobacco or menthol, which are both approved at the moment. And, you know, it, it looks like perhaps flavors are choice matters, choice matters. I'll, I'll put that there. Um, so one of our participants was saying that, you know, he doesn't even want to choose because he's afraid. What if he likes it and then it's not available in the store? So am I, is he going to get, you know, put hooked on something or need, and then he won't have drug distribution of it. So he doesn't even want to try because he's afraid that it will be outlawed. Um, so, you know, San Francisco, the data are, are really unfortunate with the flavor ban and what's happened with combustible cigarettes. So I'm not a big fan of that right now. Well, can I follow up? Has there been any impact on 
uh, initiating uh, either e-cig or cigarette use among kids in those areas that have bans? You know, they've, they've gone down. I mean, they're still going down. There's a little uptick in some combustible, but not enough to know what's happened. It's among the adults that you see the difference. Yeah. So I, I got to ask an open-ended question. Um, do you see any implications for other addictive substances, opioids, stimulants, from what you're learning about e-cigs? Well, you know, and for within other, you know, opioids, we do take a harm reduction approach. That's the whole approach with, you know, appropriate um, medications and substitutes. And we learn, but I think what we've d done a little better there, well, not much better, maybe I was going to say, um, is accepted users as needing help and now starting to provide better access. And, you know, whereas we really come down hard on smokers and don't have much sympathy for them. So I think that's an unfortunate approach. So I'm going to ask what was in my mind more directly. Um, would flavoring some yeah. production products help with others? Maybe. maybe. I, yeah. I, I mean, I thought that was where you're going and I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's It definitely helps the you know with the tobacco i mean the flavors of tobacco there are also all these different tobacco flavors i mean think about pipe i mean cigarettes have been more restricted but they do have different tastes i mean it, manufactured have as opposed to like pipe and different flavors so um flavors i think it's choice people want to be able to find something they like well this has been really eye-opening robin thank you so much for um being here today. And I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, those rates continuing to go down with uh, the help of all your insights. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.